Good morning. Uh, this is my second time at Search Fest. I think a couple of years ago I spoke on uh, paid search. And since then, I've been sort of in the display world working for uh, True Effect. Um, this sort of chapter at True Effect is sort of coming to an end in about a week, and I'll let you know what I'm doing next uh, in a few minutes. I very much enjoyed the last time here uh, being able to uh, you know, experience a very sort of engaged and sophisticated audience here, as well as tasting some of the great wines uh, up in Oregon last time I was here, which I look forward to uh, doing again. So today I'm really going to talk about one of my passions is I come from search, like many of you. I was most of my beginning of my career, I was in search, and I've sort of expanded across a lot of channels, building as well as doing marketing within those channels, and want to sort of give you my thoughts about first of all, how marketing's changing and moving and expanding, as well as how search people are actually primarily positioned to succeed in the new world of marketing. And I've seen that, and I want to sort of bring that across to you in terms of, you know, once you get to the end of search, you've sort of gone through all of SEO and paid search and, and basically maxed out the supply in those channels, like how do you grow your business and how do you get more people in the top of your funnel and make the funnel more productive as you go through? Um, I think a lot of you have been in search probably for 5, 10, 15 years, have probably seen me speak or have, have heard of me. I've been out of sort of the general search uh, market for I think about, or just only search for probably 5 or 6 years. And uh, I'm actually going to be coming back to the search area again, starting in about a week, which I'll let you know about. So I think they went through my background. Obviously, some of the search pioneers, Inc. to me, powered MSN, Yahoo, um, AOL, a lot of the big portals way back then. Um, I went to Lead Fast, which is a Norwegian search engine, powered many of the European portals like T-Online and a bunch in Asia. Um, that was acquired by Overture uh, in 2003. And then later in 2003, Overture was acquired by Yahoo. And I ended up actually being back with my colleagues at Inc. to me, who were also acquired by Yahoo. Um, since then, I've done a lot of multi-channel marketing. And then for the last two years, in true effect, really learning the display business, um, which has changed quite a lot. I think many people in search say, oh, you know, display is just that you know, contextual, throw an image, you know, on a page. And I think it's changed a lot since then. Um, so next week, I'll be, next Friday, a week from today, I'll be leaving True Effect. Um, I will be going to a new job. I'm actually originally from Pittsburgh. A lot of people may not know that since I moved out of Pittsburgh when I was one years old. But uh, in Pittsburgh, the sort of big thing, as many of you know, is football. And as any, any person from Pittsburgh, the dream of your career is actually working for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So in a week, I will be uh, leaving True Effect, and I'll be leading commerce for the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is sort of a dream of, uh, dream of mine. So I'm very excited, because it will be sort of going back to sort of my roots with search, with commerce, et cetera. And so I'll be leading sort of the technology um, behind the commerce databases, and then the website, and then the internet, all the internet marketing on top of that, and sort of completely redoing the entire infrastructure uh, and site there, which I'm pretty, uh, pretty excited about. Well, to get to the regular scheduled programming, um, so I wanted to talk a bit about just how things have changed. In the beginning, it was all about sort of intent, intent da data, and you know, search was it because. A search query was the strongest predictor of intent. And compared to many of the other channels out there, which were just contextual, you're on Yahoo Finance, I'm E-Trade, I'm just going to throw an ad up there. Um, this gave such a strong signal that people would convert. And it was really just the easiest, you know, it became king. And there were a few people, many of them in this room, that were good search marketers and could dominate in this space. With that, in the, in the past, you had billboards, you had radio, you had TV. And this many, much of the advertising then was really about resonance. It was about connecting with a brand, getting that brand emotion, that sort of connection. So you'd be driving down the highway, you'd see you know, the rear end of this person who had supposedly gone through the windshield and into the billboard, and it, it was an ad about you know, wearing your seatbelts. 
And it really, search really moved this continuum over to relevance, where you type in a query and you get something relevant to your search. And here we have Apple, which is a very resonant brand, but you know, you're just basically getting a query, what you're looking for and the answer to your question. Search really became the easy button. Um, a lot of other channels weren't measurable. And in this way, we could get a very predictable CTR and then a predictable conversion rate. And this is really the only channel out there where you can say, hey, I get this click-through rate, I'm gonna get this conversion, and you know exactly the results you're getting from your marketing spend. Many other channels in the past have been typically um, very fuzzy. You're sort of praying and putting out budget there to see what works. And typically multi-channel, which has obviously expanded now, was just PPC and SEO. It was really about you know, how should I balance my PPC and SEO work? Should I bid on my brand keyword? How do I get my PPC and SEO teams to work together? And you think about that, how often does that actually happen in organizations today? There are many organizations where they're still siloed in this very simplistic world, and marketing has really moved on um, since then. When we look back, now everyone knows what social is. You know, 10 years ago, social was Webmaster World Forum. This is when many of the, uh, you know, many search marketers met was online. And many, some of the people here, uh, like Ray Hoffman, Greg Bozer, I met them through this old social forum, through DMs and through posting and having discussions about search there. And then mobile computing basically was a laptop. Everyone probably has several devices in their pockets now, but in the past, it was really one computer to one or many users, and that paradigm shifted quite a bit these days. So moving forward, we look at this. All of a sudden, sir, the field became very crowded. You know, everyone was, you know, more people ended up trying to focus and compete for that search supply. Uh, we had brands started to become good at SEO and PPC, so it wasn't those three-word hyphenated domains that were do dominating the SERPs anymore. And all the search marketers were wondering, what do I do now? My supply is constrained. There are a lot more people that are good at search in there. And they started to look at other channels and look at other opportunities uh, out there. So people were looking for change. You looked at remarketing because, and retargeting because they had very similar metrics to search. But that was really about it. The other big change that happened was on the user side. There were huge changes along with this overcrowded search space. The first of these was multi-device. Uh, typically, marketing has been set up where you have a cookie, which basically um, is a proxy for a user. And so you'd say, hey, each device is going to be one user. And right now, people in 2017, Cisco thinks the average user is going to have five different devices. So how am I going to look at the conversions? How am I going to measure how successful my marketing is? Facebook recently said that 35% of people that interact with an ad actually convert on a different device. So you can see from that perspective, if you've got some marketing starting up at the top of the funnel, it's going to be very hard to attribute that final conversion to your top of the funnel introduction uh, marketing. Next, we had obviously a lot of social channels coming up, as well as native advertising. Uh, we have social channels, some of them look more like search, uh, but some don't, and they all have different lengths for titles and descriptions. And then we have native advertising. With the dawn of mobile, a lot of advertising moved into the main channel because they don't have that right frame that Google had with AdWords as well as many, uh, mu much of the other content on the uh, internet. Um, so things were moving into the main line and almost looking very much like content rather than ads that we've tried to before. And this is actually very similar to what happened in search. I think over the last 15 years, you've noticed the search ads look, have looked more and more like organic results as the years have gone by. And that's actually been very intentional. When you become a public company, you need to start driving growth and making more money. And the CAGR of search, the growth of search has actually started to flatten out more. 
And so the companies have been under pressure to grow that monetization. So if we look at search, and this is one of the big, you know, big points, is in terms of time spent, it's actually a very small proportion of the time online. But when we look at the other uh, axes of conversions, we see a lot of the conversions uh, coming from search. So search tends to work throughout the funnel, but obviously very well at the bottom of the funnel. So I think if, if we as search marketers want to grow the top of the funnel as well as improve the pr productivity throughout the funnel, be it search click-throughs, be it branded queries, be it unbranded queries, be it email open rates, we're going to have to start working at different parts of the funnel and across the customer journey. And we see, obviously, social we see as big, email, video. These are the, uh, and even online games and blogs, these are things that search doesn't really attack uh, at this point. And we're going to have to broaden that out what we do to really uh, broaden our scope. We look at something like display. Um, display we used to buy contextually. We used to be E-Trade, we used to want to buy Yahoo Finance. And that was just very easy. We knew someone was coming to look at finance, they probably were stock traders. So we just slap an ad on that. Um, technology and data on the display side, as well as social, I mean many like Facebook bought Atlas, so they've got this technology to serve both uh, on their network as well as off the network. It's actually expanded both on the advertiser side, which is called the buy side in the display land, or the publisher side, which is called the sell side. Um, so what's, happening, what's happened is, before this used to be the realm of fax machines and very um, simple technology, right now people are actually using a lot of data and it's become a lot more similar to search. So when an impression comes on ESPN, uh, people are actually using audience data, using a lot of data that they know about that user to figure out how much that user is valued by, the, by each of the different advertisers. And each advertiser will put in a bid, very similar to how AdWords worked for a query, to bid on that user. And the person that bids the highest will gain that impression. And there's a lot of data that goes into this, and the person with the most data wins. And you'll see a lot of times in marketing these days, they say data is, is an organization's second most valuable asset, the first obviously being your employees. And this is what it's going to take to win. And all this data almost gets you to that search intent. So search intent was strong, but I think if you know all the demographic, the psychographic, and other data about a user, you can get really strong intent and start marketing um, to those users. So the different types of data a lot of people are using, the first is what we'll call first party data, CRM data. This is data you get from registration, you get from your on-site behavioral data, um, as well as offline data. So a lot of companies now are actually marrying offline data, what you buy at Walmart, with your online identity. And this will help you further get that 360 degree profile of the customer. Um, third party data, which has been largely a target for many privacy advocates is basically beacons and tracking mechanisms that are put on different sites around the web to understand what a user does. So Edmunds, which is a you know, car company where you buy cars from or lead gen for cars, they'll have a, a tracking mechanism for a third party. It might be Epsilon, maybe Data Logics. And then they will sell that data to other car vendors. So car vendors will say, hey, if someone, some user went to Edmunds, they're five or six times more likely to buy a car in the next 30 to 60 days. So that's what we're talking about, that sort of um, inferred data or aggregated data. And then second party data, this used to be in search terminology, this was what you used to get query data from Google. So it was Google's first party data, and then they would give it to the publisher or the advertiser being synonymous, and that would become second party data. So it was someone's first party owned data, and now it, it will become second party data. But what a lot of vendors are doing now, you're, a tra you're this hotel. Um, you might exchange data with the airline company. So the airline company would say, hey, someone just booked a flight to, or a hotel room in Seattle, I'm in a market 
for them to sell flights to, uh, to Portland. So this is a way different people are sharing their first party data to get that much stronger view of the customer. And what a lot of people are doing now in marketing is they're, they're using this data to start segmenting customers and serving them different ads to move them through the purchase funnel. So when people come to a specific site, they'll segment them into an unknown user. This is a user we haven't seen before, otherwise known as net new. This is sort of the goal of many advertisers. They want more net new because they already have a relationship with many customers. You also have people that are visited before where you've got uh, people that have lagged or people that have lapsed or people that have visited in the last 30 days. So you might want to advertise differently to those folks, as well as people you have more data on with a product interest uh, versus an existing customer where you're looking to upsell and cross-sell. So you can see with this, you can use your data you know about customers to serve them different ads. And as we know from search, a relevant ad is a lot, you know, is going to get clicked on or convert uh, at a much higher rate. So moving on to the storytelling side of things, uh, you know, initially you look at one channel and there's not that much of a story to tell with the data. A lot of people are looking at metrics, you know, what's my conversion rate, what was my cost per lead, et cetera, but they're not looking at all the different interactions that someone might have on their path to purchase or even post-purchase on getting those people to interact with your brand uh, more strongly. One of the advantages of this is you're really gonna understand which of your channels are, are performing and which aren't, as well as, um, as, well as um, understanding you need to be, these days in B2B and B2C, you need to be in all channels. You need to be in a lot of different channels because people want to see you wherever they are. And one example I have about storytelling with data, this was, we had a, a car rental company and they were just looking at their retargeting spend. And they were seeing that they were getting a lot of people were actually clicking on the retargeting ads and booking. And it looked like a hugely successful campaign. But what was actually happening when we looked at the story of what was happening with these users is they would go to the car rental company, they would book a car, and then the retargeting pixel would come down, and then they would go around the web to social and other sites and they would see, oh, I can get $60 off my next rental. So they would click on the ad, they would go back to the car rental website, they would cancel their booking, and then they would rebook their car rental. So as you can see from this, if you're using your data, just looking at your data, is my retargeting working in a single channel? You would say, wow, my click-through rates are through the roof, you know, this is really working well. I need to expand my money in retargeting. But if you actually look at the data storytelling and look what's going on with the user, you're gonna realize that something's going very wrong and you're actually losing a lot of money here. There are obviously ways to change the way you do retargeting, which I would recommend, but this is what I'm talking about, is like figuring out what the story is rather than looking at the metrics. Because sometimes you think at a high level, things are working and they're not. The other side of storytelling, looking at the resonance and relevance, um, I really think right now things are gonna move from relevance back sort of in the middle more to, to resonance. When I look at my you know, new role with the Steelers, if someone's looking for a terrible towel and they just do a search and they see this towel, they can buy that anywhere. But if they realize, you know, on the left, you have resonance, like what are you gonna do with that towel? What's the experience? Does it get you excited? What's the emotion? That's how we're gonna gain market share against the competition, is providing that experience, that emotional bond, that if you come to the Steelers store, you're gonna get that different experience, and you're gonna get that emotional connection. So I think that's sort of where a lot of us need to move and just sort of get out of the relevance-only marketing, because that, that's gonna be good, but you're still constrained by the supply, and you're still bringing people in one by one. You're not creating that connection where they're automatically gonna to go to your brand uh, the next time, bypassing search, which we're seeing a lot in the marketplace now. One of the 
um, sort of inhibitors of this brand storytelling in you know, the Facebook world and the display world and all across uh, advertising is add what measurements way off. If we look at cookie targeting, a lot of um, people are using multiple devices. A lot of um, cookies are getting deleted by security programs on a regular basis. Uh, we do a lot of campaigns where we're seeing our advertisers reach in the third party environment with third party cookies, we're seeing them reach two and a half billion people in the United States. So we can see the US population is a little over 300 million, and we see the internet populations as about 250 million. So how are our metrics looking? How is frequency looking when you know, we've got a 10x number of people than real people? So we're obviously hitting these people a lot more than we think. So when you look at your retargeting campaigns in Google and you see a frequency of two, it probably isn't two. It's probably more like eight or 10. So a lot of these metrics like frequency, reach, as well as site overlap about you know, are you reaching the same users across sites or way off? And I think that's going to change with a lot of new entrants in the marketplace. And this is sort of the holy grail for a lot of uh, companies right now. And we see people like Facebook, Google, and Apple going after this market, people with persistent logins that have identity information, because they can accurately map a user um, map a user across all devices and across all publishers. And I think you'll see, I mean, Facebook bought Atlas, and this is really what they, um, what they bought Atlas for. It's doing that pe what they call people-based marketing. So it's saying, I'm going to basically be able to market to these users across all devices and get proper measurement. And the other advantage of that is they're going to be able to take offline data, things you bought at Walmart and other vendors, so I can see, did my marketing impact offline spend as well as online spend? And we're going to see Google competing, obviously, with this. They have, email, obviously, a big email identity pool. Google Plus obviously hasn't been uh, that successful. The downside of you know, having these big companies come in here is they're going to create these walled gardens. So as you saw from Google Display Network recently, uh, they stopped allowing third parties to measure um, measure within Google Display Network. And I, I imagine this non-measurement or not allowing you to sort of measure within these walled gardens is going to impact you know, how you spend and having a third-party view of how successful these programs are. Because if Facebook's measuring Facebook, Google's measuring Google, that's sort of like a you know, kid grading his own homework. Because you know, there really isn't any you know, adult supervision to say what's really going in this marketplace, on in this marketplace, as well as how um, third part, how other channels are impacting Facebook or Google. So you're not going to be able to get this broad view across the internet of how your marketing's performing. So looking at, you know, attribution, this is, I came from search. Last click is really what you guys, um, you know, look at. Um, last click really is saying the last um, click before conversion gets 100% of the credit for that conversion. So anything upstream, like an email, display, a Facebook ad, none of that is actually getting any uh, credit for that conversion. Uh, other, um, other attribution methods are first click. Not many people use that. but. I think the key thing to notice here is the introduction to the brand, the first time that someone interacts with the brand, is obviously a very important um, interaction. And that's something people should get credit for. You've obviously got linear, uh, which everyone's getting the same credit for each touch. And then a position based, uh, where you're giving more credit potentially to the first, the introduction, and the last um, touch or the last click. And then you've got a time decay where you're giving more um, credit to interactions that happened more recently. Uh, one of the big um, you know, turning points here is, is it last click or last touch? So I think in the search perspective, you always look at clicks a click. If someone views the ad but doesn't click on it, I'm not going to give someone credit for this. 
And this was something I was very convinced, you know, coming from the search area, I was like, hey, I should, you know, a click's a click, that's what I really value. Uh, but, you know, more recently, I've seen that clickers are not your converters in many cases. Um, you can see from this data, this data came out of Conrad Feldman from Quantcast, and it's a very interesting uh, research they did. Um, but I think if you look at the, the, the high level of it, is if you look at clickers, uh, which are on the left, you have a very disproportion of clickers that are young people, sort of under, 21, under 25, and then over sort of 60, the older people. And you can see your converters are actually, in the bottom chart, are the complete opposite. So what this shows, if you optimize for the click and not the conversion, you're actually heading in the completely wrong direction here. Um, I think on the other side of things, you look at the click-through rate of display or Facebook, it's very low. So if you're optimizing for your, convert, for your clickers, you're optimizing for a much smaller uh, group than your converters. So from a statistical perspective, it's also the wrong way to go. And this research from Quantcast was one that really sort of showed me the light and showed me that optimizing for, for conversions, which is real, is a much better direction to go. So looking at you know, how I would recommend you know, doing attribution, a lot of, you know, if you're moving out of last click, it's a lot more complex. But your business with you know, just looking at search, you've got a limited supply. So it's like, how do I grow the funnel? How do I give credit to other channels, be it Facebook, be it display, be it anything else? A lot of people are using U-shaped attribution right now, where they give credit, most credit to the first touch and the last touch. So the first touch will be the introduction of the brand, you give one point, and then the last touch, uh, you give 1.2. So this might be the last click, it might be the last ad a person saw uh, before they converted. And I think it's very important right now to look at viewability, which is really, did the user actually see an ad, not whether the ad was actually served to the user, because if you're doing retargeting, and you serve a retargeting ad, but that ad was at the bottom of the page and never viewable, you're gonna give a lot of credit, or too much credit if you're using last touch, to that retargeting. And then the middle touches are one over end points. So you take uh, one point and you divide it by the number of touches in between. So what this attribution method's gonna make you do is give a lot of credit to and a lot of money to publishers and other people that are first and last touch, but you're gonna optimize all of the touches in between. So you're gonna look at, give much smaller credit to all those publishers that aren't really giving you those overall value and optimizing and, and negotiating your rates or just lowering your bids on all those other touches. So going forward, uh, you know, I feel this, um, you know, the way things are going, I think one, you're gonna need to m move back away from relevance and back into the middle and get more resonance uh, with your brand. I think second of all, it's all about data these days and data ownership. The people with the most data uh, and, under and better understanding of the customer will win in these days of marketing. I feel that search marketers, many of you here have been in search, very data-driven, um, obviously very tech-savvy. Um, a lot of other marketers, you look at the display world, I go to display conferences and you know, everyone's on Twitter, everyone's on you know, social media, and pretty technical on the you know, search side of things. You go to d display conferences, much less so. So I feel that um, you know, search people have a, lot, a big advantage in sort of moving more cross-channel uh, because many of the skills you guys have had for many years in page search and SEO really translate into this new world of marketing. I think one final thought to, um, to end on is I recently wrote an article about ROI versus ROAS, which is return on investment um, versus return on ad spend. Uh, this is something many marketers think is the same thing. It's just a different way to calculate your success. But there's a subtlety underneath it which really changes the way you look at marketing. So initially with offline brands, 
we looked at, you know, 15 years ago, we were always looking at ROI, return on investment. This is a way where we actually look at the profitability of our company and how we're actually growing our business. Uh, this changes from market, this looks at marketing as being an investment. So you go to your board, you go to your CEO and say, hey, I want to invest this much money and I'm going to make this much more profit. When online came around, many of the early online marketers were looking at ROI and were told, ROI is wrong, we need to look at return on ad spend. We need to grow the number of you know, leads we have in our funnel. We need to grow the number of leads we have in our channel. And I feel now with marketers, there's this, people call it FOMO or fear of missing out. Like, what if I miss out on impression? What if, what if I don't bid for my brand term on PPC? And we need to really shift back to this ROI from return on ad spend, which is looking at ROAS, return on ad spend, is looking at marketing as a cost. So you're looking at like, hey, you go to the CEO, CEO and you say, hey, if we don't do this, we're not going to make this revenue. And it's a subtle difference, but I think it's, as marketers, we should ask more of ourselves and we should ask, how are we looking at, how do we move out of being a cost center to something as being proactive and a return on investment for our company. And that's what I'll leave you with. But thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, the Q&A and getting some questions. Thank you. All right, we have a couple microphone runner volunteers. Brad and Winnie. Here's Brad up front. Winnie, where are you? you to raise your hand if you have a question. And They'll bring the microphone to so you. There's one here. Right here in the middle. So my question's about remarketing. I have lots of very small and local clients, and I have not been able to figure out how to economically tap into the power of remarketing and get the information needed to make those successful from an ROI perspective. Wanted to get your perspective on remarketing for very small or local companies rather than major national brands. So, so what, how many, um, oh, just one, one question back. Um, so how many unique visitors do you have in a month for your small clients? Roughly, just... 300? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 2,000? Yeah. I mean, that I, range, not yeah. the tens of thousands, not the hundreds of thousands. I, I think it's, um, it's very hard to make remarketing work if you're a very small site. I mean, in a true effect, we have probably eight to 10,000 unique visitors. And um, it's very hard to, just the recognition, you know, you drop a cookie and with the cookie churn, it's very, you're not gonna recognize that many users. And even with a site of eight to, uh, you know, 10,000 UVs, it's gonna be very hard to spend enough money with retargeting to really have a significant impact on your business. Um, you know, I would say that what I would do, and I think many of the people, search people are stuck, is, because retargeting has a very similar metric framework as search, um, you feel that's sort of in your comfort zone. Um, but when you look at the incrementality of retargeting, so a lot of people, you wonder, hey, if I didn't serve that retargeting ad, would someone have bought anyway? And when we do A-B tests and do holdout groups, we see that the incremental lift, they're probably between 10 and 35, 10 and 35% of retargeting is actually incremental. So when you do your, your attribution, you can't get, be giving 100% credit to those retargeting conversions. You need to take some number, or either do a test, or just take some number, 20, 25% incrementality so you can better look at your spend. I would recommend with those sites where you don't really have enough visitors is to try and actually do some um, you know, top of the funnel prospecting. Because we actually see in many of our clients, they're spending too much money on retargeting because they can easily justify it versus prospecting where they're actually getting a lot more people in the top of the funnel, which I think would work much better. Uh, so how would you uh, go back from like resonance to, or from relevance to resonance? Like what kind of like strategy do you go about that? and how would you convince like, higher-ups who are more about 
just the money aspect of it and not necessarily looking for, you know, the resonance, which is obviously more like personal kind of feelings, you know, uh, how would you convince them that that's the better way of going about it? Well, I think one, I think one way you've really got, the, the hard part of that really is to go back and, you know, we started to do it with, you know, the new company I'm with, it's like, why should someone come here? Right, other than for like they see an ad and they click. It's like, why would someone come back here um, again rather than going to a competitor? And how do I create that stickiness? And I think the ROI really comes down to um, if people are coming back for free the next time over and over again, then you can really, if you can buy into that and you can prove it, I think it justifies itself rather than if you're in that relevance model you're really paying for every introduction over and over again for that specific person, even though they bought from you before. You're not leveraging that relationship or that data between the brand and the user. So I think it's, it's really saying, hey, we can, if we can um, create that connection with the user, we're going to get them coming back again and again for free. And I think that's, the, that's an obvious sort of argument, but it takes as with most uh, marketing changes or tests, is that leap of faith. But if you don't have that reason to be or that, you know, why are we different, you're, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, I wouldn't jump off that cliff. I think you need a compelling value proposition and, and a compelling emotional connection to those users. But you've got Amazon, you've got Airbnb, you've got a lot of uh, companies like that that have been able to create that connection and resonance. Regarding U-shaped attribution, in a multi-device world, how confident do you think you can be that the first touch that's recorded is actually their first encounter with the brand? Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. We, we were, um, you know, I was recently talking to, you know, we have some big brands at TrueEffect and I was talking to someone at, um, at Match and they, they said, well, who hasn't heard of Match, right? There's certain brands where you know, everyone's an Airbnb, maybe. There's sort of Amazon, like, everyone's heard of those brands, so I think in those, um, in those instances, you can't really give a lot of credit to the first touch or the brand introduction because they're so prevalent in the marketplace. Uh, I think the other um, part of your question is really how do I connect those first touches or the top of the funnel uh, touches to my conversion, and I think typically, especially with cross-device, and traditionally that's been very hard with third-party cookies because they haven't connected, being able to connect across device, or if the cookies are getting deleted every seven days and you're in travel where the um, window between first investigation and purchase may be three months, uh, you're not going to be able to make that connection. I think now with a lot more brands using first-party cookies, um, you've got obviously Facebook and other providers starting to use Ad ID. I think that is going to become, you know, very real. Um, there's companies um, like Drawbridge that are trying to use algorithms to uh, connect devices together, but those algorithms are actually very predictive. So they're saying, oh, well, someone that has a, you know, an Apple computer is more likely to have you know, an Apple phone. And they're using things like that, which for me is very, is a broad jump. And you typically only get 40%, you know, 40% or so accuracy with that if you don't have other things like ad ID or first party cookies as the stable base, you know, under that. So I think that's gonna become more real as we move forward. But in the past, it's been fairly impossible. Each device has been its own person, and we've really been measuring a lot of advertising like people have been behaving 10, 10 years ago or even 15 years ago. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> I'm just curious. I mean, I think you, I'd love your presentation, by the way, but I'm kind of curious if there's any kind of tools that you prefer to use to try to measure attribution or, or crunch the data or to get, to get to help you find the answers you're looking for? 
Yeah, attribution's a, um, you, know, you can do it, uh, you know, if you're a small company like TrueEffect, you will, um, you know, largely be doing it, uh, you know, on spreadsheets and largely, you know, using uh, different tools like that. I think if you're a big company, you can afford to use companies like Visual IQ uh, and other uh, attribution companies. Those are super expensive, though. I mean, you're paying over $100,000 to do your attribution. But if you have enough spend, um, you know, you, you know, it will uh, move your marketing you know, up, to, up to another level in terms of really understanding you know, what's performing and what's not. Um, you know, we've worked with some, uh, in true fact, we worked with Ancestry, and we have a case study that went through it, but they largely um, couldn't really justify their display spend. And so they were just saying, we're going to ship this many dollars into display. And you know, we were able to work with them and you know, with the, the right attribution to um, really look and make display sort of a justifiable and proper channel by doing attribution the right way and being able to link more conversions all the way upstream to those first touches. So I think that you, you know, it's, it's hot. There's very, very few um, tools right now that are very rudimentary. Most of the you know, attribution tools are quite expensive, so it's really hard for um, pe people like companies of the size of TrueEffect or many of you to really uh, you know, get in that game in a very algorithmic and sophisticated game. How much, how much value do you put towards view through conversions? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, you're going to, if you're, I think to justify, a lot of times to justify display or even retargeting, you're going to need to uh, have some, you're going to have to give credit to view through. And I, I, a lot of what you're going to do in attribution to figure out your view throughs is, is your uh, attribution windows. So you might say, hey, within search, if someone clicked on search, that's a pretty strong signal. So I'll give them maybe a 14-day window to give them credit, right? And with a view through, you might say, hey, I'm actually going to narrow that down. So in a view through, I'm going to give them three days or seven days. So a lot of the attribution tools now will actually allow you to each sort of touch you're going to give them a different window uh, that goes further back. So a very strong touch, you might, like on a search, you might say, in the last 14 days, we'll count the search click. But on a view through, we'll count it on a much more compressed timeline. So I think that's a way to really uh, be able to include, um, include the view throughs. And I, I look at it very attribution very similarly to, you know, in B2B, we do lead scoring, right? And there's like an email open. And you know, a lot of email programs just open. But you want to give some credit to that, but you don't want to give as much credit as some other signals, like a click through or some other strong interaction on site with a blog. So I think it's really just adjusting the, the weighting and the scoring in your models to count it, but count it less. Does that make sense? I think there's one there. You're mentioning B2B and some things that are different. Are there other things about B2B that you can say specifically, especially when you're talking about people using Gmail for personal accounts and business, they're using their Outlook or whatever, and the challenge that you have maybe with multiple Google accounts, for example, when people have to have multiple logins for business and personal? Right. Uh, there's actually a very interesting um, um, comment about this, something that was very counterintuitive to me, and I, I was, um, I'll credit Sean Dolan, who I, I had the discussion with, but uh, we were talking about, I was saying, oh, it was really cool on a form fill on B2B, someone had put, use your business address, and I said, oh, this is genius, you know, this will really, you know, we'll get the right address, we'll know what company they're from, and Sean gave me a counterpoint, which I thought was very interesting, is a lot of, if people put in their Gmail address, that's actually more likely to be connected to social and their online identity. 
so you can actually target those users a lot, you know, a lot better. And so that was actually an interesting thing with work and home emails. And oftentimes in B2B, initially you're like, oh, we got a Gmail, we got Hotmail. It's spam. But when he told me that, it was very, um, it was sort of exciting because I don't know if many people, how many people use custom audiences here? So a few people, yeah. So what, what custom audiences allows you to do is take your email list or take your lead list and connect those email addresses with people's online identity. So it might be across Facebook, it might be across Twitter, but you can also do it across ad networks. So you can obviously hit them with email, but you can also hit them across all these sites with ads and interact with those users. And so I think that getting the home email address actually has some advantage, or the personal email address has a lot of advantages from that perspective. So that made me think, oh, I actually don't, there are pros and, there's a pros to getting both the home or the uh, business email. It looks like we're out of time. All right, hey, join me in thanking uh, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having yeah. me here.